you. Uh, aloha, and thanks for coming to my talk. Like she mentioned, I'm a PhD. I work at the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology. I just started there. Um, but before that, I got my PhD at Oregon State University, and I was studying these lionfish in the Caribbean. I'll be talking uh, quite a bit about them, just so you're familiar with a conservation problem in another part of the world that uh, is somewhat relevant to some of the problems we face here in Hawaii, and then we'll talk about a few Hawaiian case studies. Uh, so this is a picture from the Hawaiian Tropical Botanical Garden over on the Big Island. I was there a couple years ago. And I was talking to one of the caretakers, and I was curious about how many species they had there that were native. Uh, it turns out that out of the 2,000 species they have at the gardens, 36 are native. Um, wow. I think that serves as a I mean, it was, it's not surprising to me at least, uh, but I think it serves as a really powerful illustration of how good we are at introducing uh, and moving around uh, species, plants and animals and the like from one place to another. So, um, introduced species uh, are, in other words, exotic species, are species that uh, by definition, we are transferred by humans from native to new habitat. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Humans have been introducing species for a long time, and we tend to do it along these shipping routes. <clears throat> Many introductions are intentional and for the purposes of humans. So for example, we have taro and other canoe plants that were introduced here in Hawaii, or we have horses that were introduced in North America a couple hundred years ago. Uh, more recently, we introduced things like rainbow trout to over 50 countries in the world, Nile perch to Lake Victoria, and rabbits to Australia. Um, the intents of these introductions were to improve improve agriculture, um, local fishing and hunting opportunities, but they always have unintentional consequences. Uh, for example, the introduction of Nile perch in Africa, it's thought to have caused the extinction of over 150 species, cichlid species in the, in, in the lake. Uh, among introduced species, there's not just the intentional kind, there's also the accidental kind, and one that often comes to mind are rats that have been all around the world along with their diseases. There's also a very famous example of the brown cheese snake over here in Guam. Yeah, if, I don't know if many of you have heard of them, but they actually got to Guam, uh, I think around the time of World War II because they were in the, the wheel beds of airplanes that were being brought in. Uh, and because of them, there is, they've become rather infamous because there's no native snake there, and so they've uh, destroyed a lot of native biodiversity, birds and reptiles and other things that they consume. <coughs> but not all, all, not all introductions are considered harmful. I don't think anybody really considers the terror plant or the horse to be harmful, for example. Um, but those that are considered harmful, uh, we call invasive species. So that's a key distinction between introduced or non-native species and invasive species, because these are the ones that actually harm human health or economies or the environment. Uh, the bottom line, and this is a rather surprising statistic, that the world spends over $1.4 trillion every single year uh, dealing with the impacts of these so-called invasive species. So uh, today I want to start by talking about that lionfish that you saw on the first slide. And yeah, these are, in my opinion, rather gorgeous fish. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. And because of their very striking appearance, uh, they're very popular in the aquarium trade. Uh, so these guys, this particular species is Troas volatans uh, and also Troas miles, which looks identical. And they're from the Western Pacific, so not from Hawaii. Uh, these guys are native to places like Indonesia and Thailand and the Great Barrier Reef, even southern Japan. 
Um, and what people do is because we can't breed them in captivity, people go out and capture them in the wild and then they send them all over the world to become pets, aquarium pets. Um, that includes the United States, although I think in Hawaii they're actually outlawed from being imported. imported. Uh, so hopefully they, the things that I'll be talking about will not happen here. Uh, we do, uh, just for your information, we have two native lionfish species to Hawaii, but they're endemic to here. There's a much smaller one. It's about um, a few inches long. Troas fex tends to inhabit deep waters. And then we have the green lionfish, um, which looks a bit different than this, uh, but it's also uh, those two species are native and not a problem in Hawaii. So this map... Uh, shows the introduced range of lionfish, which first appeared off of Florida in 1985. Here you can look at these red dots, and in the top left you'll see the years tick off. Um, I'll just let that roll for a little while. So they went up the east coast and then they shot out to the Bahamas. They then very quickly spread across the Caribbean, the Gulf of Mexico, the northern coast of uh, South America. I'll let that roll one more time. Um, but lionfish are currently off the map spreading south um, into Brazil. There's a question of whether or not they can pass the Amazon River plume because it's a very large freshwater body that's emptying out there. Uh, and lionfish, if you look at the picture, they, they are, may not appear to be very good swimmers. That's true. So the way that these fish are getting from place to place is not by swimming, but they release their egg masses. Uh, the females produce up to 2 million eggs every year. Um, starting after one year, uh, they become sexually mature at about one year of age. Uh, and then those egg masses are carried up in the ocean currents for about one month. That's called a pelagic larval duration of one month. So in that time, the, the, the egg masses move great distances and then the surviving uh, larvae can settle onto new reefs and new places. So that's why it kind of takes some time for it to build up and then it just spreads very rapidly, very suddenly. <laughs> So not only have lionfish spread far and wide geographically, but they've also spread to multiple ecosystems in the Caribbean area. So the lionfish are habitat generalists, and they, so they can be found on coral reefs, as you see in the top left, seagrass beds, mangrove forests, and just about anywhere where there are structure. This is a shipwreck. And while we don't know very much about lionfish in their native range, what we do know is that the lionfish in the Atlantic and the Caribbean, they grow much faster than Pacific lionfish. Um, they eat larger prey on average, they're predators. Uh, they grow much faster and they reach larger sizes. So I was just mentioning to a gentleman in the back that they can get to be um, a little over a foot, but sometimes even larger. Uh, in addition, to being habitat generalists, they are also predators. This lionfish had all of these fish inside of it when it was in. It's really impressive. <laughs> uh, analysis of stomach contents in the Bahamas uh, found that lionfish eat at least 56 different prey species from at least 25 different families. So if it's smaller than they are, or about, they'll, they'll eat fish that are up to half its own body length. So if it's up to that size, they will try to eat it. Um, and so the, the, this obviously makes you think or understand why people are concerned in the Caribbean, um, because they are eating ecologically important fish, like parrotfish that help to clean up the reef, they're eating uh, groupers and snappers, which are really important to the fisheries over there. And I believe there's something like three dozen nations in that region because of all of the islands and the, the, it's a very densely populated area. So a lot of these people really economically rely on some of these fish 
to survive and land fish are um, slurping them up. Uh, but humans are fighting back and they're doing it by eating lionfish. Uh, it turns out that even though their spines are venomous, so you can see their spines poking up on the top of this picture here. So their spines are not good to touch. I do, don't recommend getting close to those, but if you can avoid it, which is not very difficult once you've gotten some training, um, you can cook them and uh, the heat denatures de, uh, the venom in the spines and there's no venom or any poison um, in the meat at all. So it's 100% safe once it's dead. <laughs> <laughs> yep, and a lot of people just clip the spines off when they're in the water. I try not to do that when I've dealt with them just because a loose spine is more dangerous <laughs> when I don't know where it is, so. Uh, yeah, I've, uh, the, I've gotten stung once by a small lionfish, so its venom was a little less potent, but it just nicked my finger. And I had, luckily I was on land when it happened, and we just had to, somebody had brought hot tea onto the boat, and you just dip your hand in as close to boiling water as you can, uh, just to get the venom to, to be on. Not comfortable. So all across the invaded region, people have been hosting lionfish derbies uh, that give prizes for the most lionfish caught, the biggest lionfish, even the smallest lionfish. Uh, and a lot of them in various places have been hosted by this organization called Reef. Uh, they report that um, from 2009 to 2018, they've removed 24,522 uh, lionfish mostly around Florida and the Bahamas, but at several other places too. And this may sound like a lot, but it's considering the millions of lionfish out there in that region, it's really a drop in the bucket. Um, they even created a lionfish cookbook, um, which is a really excellent idea just to get people familiar and comfortable with the idea that you can eat these guys. They have a uh, white flaky meat that is very easily grilled, sauteed, fried, um, marinated in various ways. So, and it is, yeah. Has anybody tried them here? Yeah? Great. I hope not in their name range. <laughs> Good. Uh, so I actually wanted to open it up to you guys for a little while because I wanted to talk a bit about what you might see as the pros and the cons of establishing a fishery for lionfish. So does anybody, I mean, there are some obvious, this is a good reason to do it, and there are some perhaps less obvious reasons why it's a bad idea to do it. Any thoughts? Containment, Containment of the problem? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can, uh, there's a place on Little Cayman in the Caribbean that has done a really good job of containing it because from the very beginning, they were um, spearing and removing them. And Oh yeah, great. Yeah, they've been very, very proactive there. Um, and I think because of that, their reefs have been a bit more resilient to lionfish, but they keep coming back. Any other thoughts? Is there a larger fish uh, in any kind of quantity that uh, lionfish? Yeah, I didn't mention that. So lionfish, um, unfortunately, we in their native range in the Pacific, we do not know what their primary predator is, what eats them. There have been reports of things like cornet fish uh, eating them. But uh, in the Caribbean, nothing really eats them. There are a lot of different uh, places where people try to train large groupers and sharks to eat them. So they'll spear the lionfish and then they'll take the lionfish off the spear and give it to the um, shark or grouper sitting next to it. Um, but that's not usually a good idea to train fish to associate you with food, especially a shark. Uh, so. But so while that's been happening, the native fish have 
have not really learned to eat them on their own. Do we know what eats them in Indonesia? No, not really. Uh, the the only there have only been very uh, sparse reports, and one example was a cornet fish, which is kind of an interesting image of a long, skinny cornet fish eating a spiky <laughs> lionfish. Mm -hmm. We have the, what we locally call the turkey fish. Mm -hmm. uh, they're in the same genus. So this uh, the invade, invasive species is Troas volatans and Troas miles. And then the uh, species here is Troas fex. So same genus, different species. Are they also poisonous? Yeah, they also, like a lot of scorpions, a lot of fish in the same family also have venom. I've run into them here. Mm -hmm. uh, they're so secretive. And they're really not to the threat because you really got to stick your fingers back in a dark corner. It's not a good idea since the roommate tends to be a boring. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's why you need to have a spear <laughs> between you and the fish. But usually they're, they're not very aggressive towards humans. They more, they, they're the only time there's really a threat of being uh, poked one is when you're dealing with it on a boat or on land because then they're flopping around quite a lot. Yeah. Yes. There must be something useful in this because it's just not that common. Um, you think it might be just a little tiny one? Yeah. Lots of, lots of fish eat little tiny fish, and so maybe once they're big, you don't see them being eaten because they're not. They're just a little one. Yeah, that is um, our leading hypothesis, is that something is eating the lionfish when they're really small, and therefore probably less potent or less abundant venom and easier to pick off. But they are really cryptic, especially when they're young like that. Um, but we even still we haven't confirmed that with any gut contents or, or genetics. Well, so some reasons why you would want to start a lionfish be in the Caribbean where they're uh, non-native is just to increase awareness and education about an invasive species, which are problematic in the parts of the world. You're obviously removing them, uh, which is a good thing because they're harmful. Uh, like the gentleman here noted, that you're assisting in what we call early detection and rapid response efforts. So the earlier you catch it, the better off uh, your reefs will be. And if you have a fishery for them, presumably you will boost local economies. So these are a few reasons why it might be a good idea. Um, some, oh, cons are something I call your, your creating perverse incentives. So because you are establishing a demand for something that shouldn't be there, you're encouraging people to maintain that supply. So instead of going out and removing all of the lionfish, maybe someone will go out and remove a few and then save a few for later, even though they know it's bad, you know? So that that's the, the kind of human aspect of why it would be maybe looks good to create a lionfish fishery. Um, lionfish could also become culturally important despite their harm. Uh, that may sound silly, but if you think of all the examples in Hawaii where that's been become the case, I'll talk very briefly in a minute about the, the feral pigs. You know, they're a big problem, but very popular. <laughs> um, and also removals might not work. And you're dealing with a lot of lionfish across the Caribbean. And in fact, they've been found in submersibles down at depths of about a thousand feet. So it's a real head scratcher about whether or not we're making a dent by doing it. 
Uh, does it work for other invasive species? I'm going to list a few examples. So there's something called the Asian carp in the Great Lakes. And this picture, um, you may not be able to tell, but all of these things jumping out of the water are Asian carp. And here's a boat for scale. And they're afraid of uh, the, the motor sound. And so when a boat drives by, they tend to jump like that. And there have been some problems with them even hitting people and knocking them unconscious on boats because they're such large creatures. Um, the problem here is that even though they're a problem ecologically, it doesn't sound good to eat a carp. It's not something that a lot of people eat in the Great Lakes region. Um, even though I believe it, and they're from China and people do them there. So people are trying to make it a little better to see if they can make it more attractive. A very similar kind of story is Nutria. Uh, these are large rodents from South America. I uh, live in California and they were there. They're an introduced species in the Northwest and also in the Southeast. And it's the same thing where they're a large problem where they're non-native, but nobody wants to eat a nutria. Uh, this is a really interesting story. Paiche, I believe, in Bolivia, uh, also called Arapaima. They're endangered where they're native, which is Brazil and Peru. Um, but because they were endangered, they created these hatcheries. Um, and they did well in the hatcheries. They got out and they escaped into uh, Bolivia, where they're not native. And in Bolivia, they're wreaking havoc. They're, I think they're eating a lot of native fish. Um, and so that's a really interesting case because they're still not doing well in their native region. They're doing way too well in their non-native region. And it's because of they created this uh, hatchery and this lucrative fishery. Uh, I already mentioned this example. So the feral pigs, big problem, but culturally important. There's the holy roy or the peacock grouper. Uh, it's not thought that these are harmful necessarily uh, ecologically, but uh, they may be cyclotoxic, so a lot of people don't want to eat them, which is a good idea. I don't advise getting ciguatera. Um, don't know about lionfish yet. It's kind of still an ongoing experiment. So challenges to lionfish fishery in the United States, so the eastern seaboard mostly. This is a flow diagram from a paper written by a person named Gallagher, uh, but I think it nicely illustrates kind of the concerns. So at the top here, we have lack of interested fisheries, um, so a lack of education on environmental issues or fear of the venomous spines. Um, the, another challenge is inconsistent supply, so you get high transaction costs and or, and or limited supply, and then a lack of inclusion on restaurant menus and grocery markets. So there could be FDA scare, high retail value, or lack of consumer knowledge on lionfish species. So these are just some hypothesized challenges and some that are actually coming to fruition. Um, the Whole Foods is actually like this um, This uh, article title uh, says is selling fresh lionfish from Florida to ease the impact of the invader. Uh, and so they've teamed up with Reef and they have had six co-sponsored events in 2018. I don't know if you can read over here, but it says that they're selling them for $7 a pound. So pretty good deal. They're trying to incentivize uh, choosing to eat lionfish, especially right after Reef has their big derbies where they're catching thousands and thousands of fish. Um, this is small writing, but I'll give you the, the lowdown. So this is challenges to lionfish fishery in the Caribbean. Uh, and then a, one barrier is that the minimum size of the export market discourages a lot of fishermen in some of these small countries. Um, fishers harvest, harvest lionfish opportunistically, maintaining traditional fisheries as their primary target. So 
it's hard to convince fishermen that they should be catching lionfish instead of the things that them, their grandfather and people before them were um, catching for many generations, which is understandable. A uh, domestic market is seasonal and poorly coordinated and inconsistent. So you might remove a whole bunch and then you don't have any. So you've got to wait for them to come back until you, you can offer the, the have a market for them again. And then fishing restrictions in marine protected areas make commercial markets unavailable as a management tool. That's actually really interesting because marine protected areas we think of as places where you're, nobody's allowed to fish at all um, in many cases. Uh, but what if the fish is an invasive species? Um, some marine protected areas in the Caribbean have made special exceptions. But once you make an exception, that makes it really challenging. And then other places haven't made the exception. And so lionfish continue to, to grow and thrive. And they actually have these areas where, where they're doing quite well, where they're not supposed to. Um, these, are, this is, these are some images from some creative women in Belize. They started um, creating these value-added products where they would take lionfish fins. So all these are earrings made from lionfish fins. You cut the, the tail fin off and fan it out and let it dry in the sun. You bake it, basically. Uh, and then you shellac it, and you can add various colors to the fins uh, to make them more decorative. But this was a way for them to uh, try to make a little more money for themselves and their families. So um, now that I've talked quite a lot about lionfish in the Caribbean, I was wondering if uh, how many of you are aware of what kind of invasive species or introduced species we have here in Hawaii. So can I want to name examples? Yes? You have your algae. Mm -hmm. And you have that um, octocoral that's uh, growing on the black coral. Yeah, is that is that one called snowflake coral? I, the, is the common name snowflake coral? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so invasive algae and... Um, Something that's interesting, as I read it, the mm -hmm. Bishop Museum has a program on this, and they've got 287 species of uh, marine invertebrates in Hawaii, but only about uh, five or six of them are invasive. Oh, wow. Well. It's a long swim to get. No, 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 no. Bottoms of barges. Yeah, that is the source. the bottoms of barges and is um, a common source of a lot of invasive species around the world uh, in the marine environment. Um, did someone else have something? Well, you mentioned the uh, uh, peacock grouper. Yeah, yeah, I already mentioned that one. Gave okay. it away. <laughs> the only fish out there that have managed to tame the gray eels and the fish. Yeah, well, sometimes I think they might be a bit cooperative with the mores, but I, uh, I need to, or with even with the, the, the omilu as well sometimes. I saw an interesting interaction the other day snorkeling between omilu and the bluefin trevally, and um, the roy, the peacock grouper, where they were both going after the same fish, and, you know, the grouper can get into the reef and kind of fish it out. Uh, not to the extent that an eel can, but they can do that more. And then the trevally was up in the water column, just kind of waiting. And so, but the, the fish must, the little fish must have been injured. I hardly ever saw it, but the the roy struck so fast when it came out, I, I couldn't even tell if it got the little fish. <laughs> Any others? Tilapia, yeah, yeah. They're kind of one of the those weird examples where they can be either marine or freshwater because they uh, can withstand both salinities. Mm -hmm. Is tilapia really a fish? Yes, tilapia is a fish. It's a kind of cichlid originally from Africa, uh, but it's uh, one of those species that's very easy to raise for aquaculture in part because it can withstand both freshwater and saltwater. 
Uh, and so it's are all over the world and it tends to get out. Uh, so that's why it's become non-native and or invasive in many areas. Is there an, a situation in which you thought that it might not be a fish? Hmm. I think there are scales. I believe there are scales. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But yes, they are fish. Any others? Uh, the crown of thorns is more of a problem over in the Great Barrier Reef. They're actually native to that region, but they get these huge outbreaks. Um, and I believe that people associate that with um, like flooding events when you get a whole lot of nutrients uh, that go out into the water and they just they have a, a big spike in their abundance and eat the coral. Uh, but yeah, to my knowledge, they're not a problem anywhere in any other circumstance. I have pictures of them there. Yeah? Yeah, don't touch those either. They're not comfortable. All right, so now that we've gone over a few, this is just a list mm -hmm. that I took from the Hawaii DLNR, the Department of uh, Land and Natural Resources. They list on their website, peacock group roy, flake coral, uh, tilapia, upside down jellyfish, keyhole sponge, and then freshwater, there's quite a few examples, and then quite a few invasive algae, and then things that they didn't mention on their website were things like mangrove, Samoan crab, ta'ape, to'au, and kanda. There's, I'm sure there are many others. So I'm just gonna go through a few of these case studies. Uh, so this is the Gorilla Ogo. So this is one of the serious um, seaweed problems because it tends to overgrow native habitat, both coral and native limu. Uh, so the DLNR created this, they have a very creative way to get rid of it. In some areas it's called the super sucker uh, <laughs> and they literally go out uh, with a kind of vacuum cleaner on the reef to remove by hand the the algae that's on the reef. So I'm just going to show you a quick video uh, that gives you some imagery. The natural beauty of Kaneohe Bay belies the trouble that lurks beneath its surface. Here, the Nature Conservancy and the state are working to free the bay's reefs from the suffocating grip of the invasive action. Using large underwater vacuums called super suckers, crews are removing up to 2,000 pounds of invasive algae an hour. For Kaneohe Bay, the super suckers are a game changer. The difference between returning its coral reefs to health or watching them slowly succumb to the chokehold of invasive algae. Okay, so um, they the this algae grows quickly, spreads by fragmentation, overgrows other things, but the price tag on doing something like that is pretty high. If you hadn't heard, I think the numbers that I heard were that. For an area about the size of six soccer fields in Kaneohe Bay, it cost $800,000 to remove. So really high operating costs. The good thing is that it works really well. Um, and the idea is if they invested in uh, removing the Gorilla Ogo and other invasive algae in, with this method in Kaneohe Bay, that they would uh, prevent it from spreading to other parts of the island and the other islands. Uh, those um, high price tags up front, but hopefully for a big payout in the end by saving other environments. How long does that last? Uh, I think it's been relatively permanent to my knowledge, but I also think that they attribute um, it's the fact that the that the levels of Gorilla Ogo are low to a storm event that we had that just swept it all off the reef and a lot of it disappeared. 
after that as well. So it was a kind of a one-two punch of this removal and then the storm event ripping it off the reef. Mm -hmm. Are they able to use the water other purposes was the yeah yeah oops i want to show that again uh so i was gonna get into that great question uh they use the gorilla ogo for food you may have had it in your poke and not even known it mm -hmm. and they also there's a group that maybe some of you are uh, involved in called uh, malama monolua they're a local organization that removes invasive algaes from Mauna Loa Bay, and they claim that since 2007, uh, they've removed three and a half million pounds of this invasive algae. And I think what they do uh, mostly is they take it and donate it to farms as fertilizer. So it's a combination of fertilizer and food for this particular species. Uh, another one that's maybe a little bit less food related, but that I think is really interesting is the mangrove. In most parts of the world, mangrove is a very important native species. Um, it, it forms coastal protection and habitat for juvenile fishes. But unfortunately here on Oahu, it was introduced in 1922. And it's become a large problem, especially in Kaneohe Bay because um, it Well, it does what it was supposed to do, which was to trap a lot of the sediment that was coming off of the land from farming practices, a lot of sugar um, plantations in the area. Um, but it's done so, so well that we have some of the biggest mangrove forests in the entire world now. Um, and then this, these pictures are of the Heia fish pond. Have any of you been there? Yeah, it's a really gorgeous place um, and this is the wall of fish pond that was created 800 years ago or, or it's very old uh, and then that wall was overgrown with mangrove and this whole area is mangrove and then there's a little mangrove island here so over the last two decades the um, Heia fish pond the organization there has been doing um, very regular weekly cleanups where they remove it manually. Uh, and so now you can look at the picture in the bottom right and you can see that this is clear of mangrove. And then today, none of this mangrove is here in the corner and that whole mangrove island is gone, but they keep working back and back and back to remove it. And the idea, the reason they wanna remove it is so that they get better flow of water so that the mangrove is, um, once they remove the mangrove, they've seen the return of a lot of native water birds that had been gone from the region for a while. Um, so they're restoring native wetland habitat by removing the mangroves. Um, and it also turns out that the, so they're, it may not be food, but they're using the mangroves um, to build a lot of the structures that they have there at the fish pond. Um, it's very strong, dense wood. Uh, and they, I believe they occasionally sell it um, or give away perhaps um, for, smoking because it, it's a good wood for smoking meat. Another one that's associated with the mangrove is the Samoan crab, also known as the mud crab or the mangrove crab. Um, as you might guess, it was from Samoa. We brought it over, uh, I think it was in, the, what do my notes say? I think it was in the 1920s as well. Yeah, 1926. It was introduced to Oahu, Molokai, and the Big Island. And the reason was to establish a crab fishery here. We have a lot of native, small, small native crabs, but no giant ones like these guys. Um, so it's, unfortunately, nobody's really studied their ecological impact, but they are very large, fast-growing carn carnivores. Um, so it stands to reason that they are affecting native invertebrates. Uh, they have become so popular here that the state actually protects them by law. So you're not allowed to take females and you have to take males that are greater than six inches across and you need a commercial fishing license if you want to sell them. 
Uh, so this is kind of a situation where they've created or there there has there's this perverse incentive that's happening where we've introduced a species to create the fishery. Um, the fishery does great. And so now it, we protect it like any one of our other native species. So very interesting. Also interesting that nobody has um, studied it ecologically to my knowledge. So yeah, maybe people don't wanna tell it, <laughs> to tell the state that it's not a good thing. Um, the fish pond that I mentioned in the previous slide, they actually have um, Samoan crab sales signs, sign ups that you can um, get on and they sell it for $10 a pound. So even more than the lionfish at Whole Foods. And then the three fish examples that I'm gonna end on are Roy on the top left, Ta'ape and To'au. And the reason I have them all on the same slide is because they were all introduced uh, from the same place at around the same time. They were introduced in the 1950s from French Polynesia. Uh, and the idea, similarly to the crab, was to create fisheries. Because um, in Hawaii, we don't um, have, we have deep water grouper and deep water snapper, but we don't have a lot of shallow water grouper and snapper. In other parts of the world, grouper and snapper are really popular eating. Um, and so the, the idea is they would create a fishery for them. So the roy, like I mentioned before, are, um, I don't think actually any of these three species have been shown to be uh, particularly ecologically harmful, but nobody wants to eat the roy, even if they, they spear it, um, because of this thing called ciguatera. Um, for those of you who don't know, ciguatera uh, is a toxin that affects humans. It doesn't actually affect the fish. Um, the, they get the toxin in their tissue when they're, uh, the fish that they eat are eating dinoflagellates um, uh, that are on the surface of the reef. And that, uh, those toxic dinoflagellates, they accumulate in the tissue of the fish that's eating it. And then that accumulates up the food chain. So the bigger fish bigger reef fish uh, like these roy or um, some of the jacks and sharks and things um, are considered ciguatoxic and, and we can get it and have kind of not so great neurological um, uh, symptoms including the reversal of heat and cold and uh, headaches and various other things uh, so i don't recommend eating roy uh, because of that but people are still very enthusiastic about removing them, the spearfishing community in Hawaii in particular. This picture here, these are all roy, this large pile from a roy, what they call a roy roundup that they had, I think, on the big island. Um, the, so this is a poster of a, in the middle of a roy roundup. Uh, in the bottom left, I have another um, poster style uh, advertisement for defend and destroy spearfishing tournament, very aggressive. Um, and then this picture on the right in the middle, you can see all the dark fish are roy, but there's also a few yellowish fix, fish mixed in, and those are the ta'ape and the to'au. So at these roundups, they usually, um, they allow people to, to spearfish any of those three invasive species, but they restrict it to those three species and no others. Um, and it's the same kind of concept as with lionfish where they give prizes for biggest, most, et cetera. Um, so Ta'ape and To'au, the two snappers on the right, these guys um, are, to my knowledge, delicious. Um, they're perfectly edible, but nobody really eats them, <laughs> or not many people do. Uh, there, uh, these two pictures on the bottom right um, actually show some savvy, uh, savvy spear fishermen who are trying to encourage people to catch and cook them and to shoot the invasives, um, just to kind of remove the, for whatever reason, why the the aversion that people may have to these two fish. Um, to my knowledge, the reason why there might be an aversion is because they are relatively small. Um, they, I think people don't like the color. Um, and 
relatively low market value. Uh, and I think that in the 1970s, there was an effort to start a commercial fishery for these guys, but it really quickly fell off and was unsuccessful because of the low market value. Yes. Is the scale right, that bottom right? There's a hand. Oh. Well, he's got it on the end of a spear, and then his hand is in front of him. So I think that is underestimating the size of the fish. But I, they get to be about a foot or less, I think. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So, and I just was on the big island and saw really huge schools of ta'ape. Um, it was hundreds of them. Uh, they just kind of hang out together up in the water column. There's a school out there in uh, Sandman's Patch that on Square has been there for 20 years. <laughs> it probably has. <laughs> yeah, and I've seen them over at Electric Beach. They hang out there pretty regularly or always. I think every time I've been out there, I've seen them. So they're pretty common. As are, I've seen a lot of Roy, too, but Roy's, Roy's more cryptic. They're hanging out more inside the reef and they're skittish if you try to get close to them. I think part of that is because people spear them so much so they're smart and <laughs> they run away. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of the status of where we are with a few of these examples of Hawaiian species. So with that, I just wanna take any questions. And at the bottom here, I have a couple articles that you guys might find interesting. One's from Scientific American, Can We Really Eat Invasive Species in the Submission? And Travel and Leisure actually was Googling the other day and they had one, the most delicious way to protect Hawaii's natural beauty, eat the invasive species. But they're focusing on two terrestrial plants. So they're looking at Kiave and can't remember the other one, right? Oh, um, strawberry guava. Um, so that there was a, a restaurant over on Maui that was trying to target Kiave and strawberry guava to get rid of them. So thank you very much. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, well, some jellyfish are, but I don't think that the box jelly, I'm actually uncertain about the box jellyfish. I don't remember. I grew up here and I never remember having box jellyfish with. Yes. Actually, the box uh, jellyfish has been in the islands for over 100 years. Not a bit of a lot of these numbers. Yeah. 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 So, Never heard of them until I came back to Japan and what, we got this thing called box yeah. jellyfish. Yeah, and there's a professor at UH, yeah, uh, Angel Yanigara, and she studies the um, venom of box jellyfish, and she's coming up with, or has she has come up with a um, lotion that you can apply after being stung. Um, All stings. <laughs> is that what she calls it? I don't. Oh, <laughs> all stings considered clever. <laughs> yeah, but that's why I, I was, I, I apologize that I didn't address that when you said it, but that's just because I was trying to think about if it was actually invasive or not, because I didn't, I wasn't sure. Mm -hmm. I've been diving here weekly for more than 20 years, and it's only in the last 10 years that I've actually been able to get out there and see the numbers of liability of the box jellies. I mean, they like the crown of thorns in, on the Great Barrier Reef, they could be responding to some environmental change, like more well, nutrients in the water. The How do they know? <laughs> <laughs> well, it could be the uh, so convergence. Yeah. actually documented by a swimmer. Yeah, and Waikiki. He was the one who pointed that out to researchers, and then there was a study that came out, I believe, in 2014 that correlated uh, numbers of jellyfish. Um, some of that data was provided by Dr. Yanagihara and her research group, as well as, the, as well as other researchers at the University of Hawaii that correlated other environmental you know, factors to see that, is that a real observation or is it not? And actually they found, they found that it's actually eight to 12 days no. after a full moon. 
I'm sorry. 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 I'm sorry